Good morning, people of God. You know, it, uh, it's a big idea in the New Testament, and particularly in Paul's letters, and especially in Ephesians, that we are in Christ. And so we come here this morning as those who collectively are in Christ. We have this personal relationship with God uh, where we are in Christ, but we also have this collective relationship with God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at each other's faces, as we talk to one another, as we engage with our brothers and sisters, we are doing so in Christ and we are relating to those who are in Him. So what a privilege it is To be together this morning, it passes us by, it becomes ultra familiar, uh, but it really is a blessing, it really is a privilege, and I think in eternity it will be one of the things that we look back on, uh, as insofar as we look back on our lives and we just do not know how that's going to work, but we will, I think, be incredibly grateful to the Lord for all the times that he brought us to be with his people. And I think this will be the case as well. We'll see in that day, clearly, all the work he did to preserve us in the everyday gathering of his people. Things we don't even see, things we don't even realize, but the work he is doing among us and in us as we're here today. If you would go with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3, and I guess as we approach Christmas, we have actually left Christmas in the gospel of Luke, so we are leaning towards Christmas, sort of, uh, as we're coming through October, but we are moving away from Christmas in our time in the gospel of Luke. Our time spent in Luke so far has covered many of the most well-known Christmas passages in the Bible. Uh, But we recognize, as we've said before, that we never actually leave Christmas at all. Uh, In fact, Christmas is every single day. As Christ in us, the hope of glory, is transforming us into his likeness, and we are uh, gathered up in all that is the Christ event, his coming and his death and resurrection as we think about Easter, his ascension, as we wait on his second coming. So all that is implied in Christmas is applied to our hearts every single day. So we never leave Christmas. Luke begins his gospel narrative in the most natural place. He starts with Jesus' miraculous conception and birth, But not just there, as we've seen, Luke goes back to the announcement and birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, the forerunner of the Christ. So he takes us even back before the birth of Christ, before the conception of Christ, before the announcement of the conception of Christ. He takes us all the way back to this figure, John the Baptist. When we first open the gospel after the introduction by Luke, we are immediately brought to these two characters, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and these are the parents of John the Baptist. So in chapter one, right after those first four verses with the introduction to the gospel, we are immediately introduced to this priest, this priest named Zechariah, whose time it was to serve in the temple, and then Uh, Also, his wife, and both of them are described in very remnant-like terms. These are true believers. They follow the Lord. They are uh, conscientious about his word. They walk blameless before God. Then we come to Mary, and the narrative ties the two together and then focuses in on Jesus. And that's where we've been over the last few weeks. Jesus' birth, Jesus presented at the temple as a baby, And then Jesus at the temple at 12 years old. So this is what we've seen so far. John and Jesus tied together with Jesus coming out on top. John introduced, Jesus introduced, the two tied together and Jesus rising to the top. The spotlight falls on him. He's the focus. He is the preeminent one. John is the forerunner. Jesus is the fulfillment. There is expectation about John. 
and his figure, as we'll talk, his, who he is. We'll talk about that today. But Jesus is the promised Christ. He's the one that the Old Testament is full of. As we go all the way back to the Garden of Eden with the fall, God makes a promise as he's cursing Satan through the serpent. He makes a promise to Adam and Eve that Eve's descendant, future descendant, would crush the head of the serpent. And this promise continues and it, it, it goes to Abraham where God tells Abraham that his descendant will be the means by which God blesses all the families of the earth. And this continues down through Jacob and Judah's descendant up to David and throughout the prophets. The promised one is the Christ. Jesus is the fulfillment. John is merely the forerunner. And we have to say merely in a shaky way because John's importance is emphasized in the Gospels. And yet, next to Jesus, John becomes utterly tiny. He becomes as nothing next to Christ. So his significance in redemptive history is massive. But next to Christ, he just sort of shrivels, shrinks, and recedes. That is the case with all the figures in the Bible that we hold up. And we've talked about the people in the Bible being examples. And one of the things I've commented on is I think the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater. In some ways, as we come to the Bible uh, and, and we're, we're no longer, you know, sort of we've, we've moved from moralism to gospel centrality. And so in that movement, as it's understood terms, in terms of the Christian culture, we've sort of thrown out all the ways that the people in the Bible serve as examples for us. And Paul himself says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so we don't want to ever lose sight of the fact that God fills the Bible with moral teaching and moral examples. But all of those figures and all of their morality pales in comparison. And better yet, cannot even begin to be compared with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is one of the great things we are meant to see as we're going through these opening chapters of Luke. We're meant to see the great significance, the uniqueness of this one Jesus. What we've seen, uh, we see again as we come to our passage today in chapter 3. This same pattern is going to be picked up as we come to chapter 3. And the title for the sermon this morning is John and Jesus All Grown Up, Part 1. John and Jesus All Grown Up. Last week, we got a transition between Jesus as baby and Jesus as adult. So we have Jesus at 12 years old in the temple. We, we had to fast forward from uh, his time as a baby, a tiny infant. Just 40 days after his birth was the last time we saw Jesus. And then we fast forward all the way to Jesus as an older boy, 12 years old in the temple. Amazing everyone with his understanding, confounding his parents with his reference to needing to be in his father's house and then submitting himself to them as he returns home and continues to grow. And that was one of the striking things that we saw last week, is that this perfect Jesus, this one who never sinned, who is the Son of God, he submits himself to his parents, his imperfect parents, who have left their son behind in Jerusalem, who then go back, and his mom rebukes him. I mean, it may, we don't know her tone. She's frantic. She's out of sorts. But there is an accusation embedded in what she says to Jesus. She, she rebukes Jesus. Why have you done this to us? We've been looking for you. And then when Jesus explains, it just does not land on fertile soil. She doesn't get it. His parents do not understand. Joseph and Mary do not get what Jesus is saying. And nonetheless, this perfect wise son of God is also human. He's fully God and he's fully man. And as a human being, perfectly obeying God's law on our behalf, in our place, he submits himself to the authority of his parents. And I mentioned this last week, but we talked about it in our group. The question was, Jesus ever disciplined? Um, 
And I, I, I tend to think he probably was not because of anything he did, but because his parents are sinners and because his parents undoubtedly would have uh, wrapped him up in the sin of his brothers and sisters. Undoubtedly, there would have been moments where they erroneously thought Jesus had done something wrong when in fact he had not. But that's all speculation. What we need to see is that Jesus was perfectly sinless. His parents were not, and he submits himself to them nonetheless. And that's where we ended last week. It was a transition passage. Jesus at 12 years old in this transition. It is a transition between childhood and adulthood. But today, we fast forward again. And this is holding the fast forward button down a little longer. We go all the way from age 12 to age 30. So an 18-year jump, Jesus in the temple at 12 years old, and now we're going to pick up with Jesus around the age of 30. Now Jesus is all grown up. And as I mentioned before, we get the same pattern here that we found with the infancy narrative. So notice this. We're going to see this over the next couple of weeks. We have John introduced, then John and Jesus are tied together. And then Jesus rises to the top as the focus. That's the way this works. So throughout chapters one and two, we see the exact same pattern in chapter three. John introduced, Jesus and John tied together. Once that happens, John begins to recede and Jesus begins to get the spotlight. The focus is on him. This unfolds throughout the entire chapter. And we're going to take this chapter in two parts. So today we'll cover up through verse 14. And then next week, Lord willing, we'll finish with verses 15 to 38. So if you would go and stand as we read God's word together. We're going to read just those first 14 verses. Next week we'll read all the way up through verse 38. But today we're just going to look at these first 14 verses. This is the word of God. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled. And every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. You can go ahead and be seated. Let's ask the Lord's grace 
Let's ask for his blessing. Let's ask for the work of his spirit. You know, we, we come here this morning imperfectly, all of us, but God is gracious. He is kind. He is merciful to sinners. And he, he treats us not as we deserve. In Christ, his son, he treats us as his children, his beloved ones. And so we come here this morning to uh, communicate, to commune with our Abba. And we sit under his word with imperfect hearts and imperfect focus and all of that. But we ask for the Lord to nonetheless, in the midst of all of our imperfection, to be gracious to us and to use this time to change us. So let's ask for that. Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity we have to be together, to be in your word, to have our faces and our ears in divine things. Lord, this world is so full of trivialities, of passing, fleeting, breath-like, flower-like, grass-like pleasures. And Lord, we just praise you that you bring us back to home every week. You bring us back to this docking point as we come to be with the people of God and we come to be under the word of God and to hear it. Lord, what a blessing. What a grace that we do not deserve. And so, Father, help us not to presume on your grace, but to first be grateful and to second be responsive. Lord, help us to, as we have been seeing in James, to be not just hearers, but to be doers also. Lord, we come before you with a great need for help. We pray that your spirit would guide this time in the preaching and the listening and in the applying, Lord, that you would Go out and search within each of our hearts, Lord, that you would penetrate each of our hearts and make us more like your son, your beloved son, as we come here today in him. We love you, Father. We thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So we can divide this whole chapter, Luke chapter 3, into four parts, and we're going to look at the first uh, two today, and then we'll look at the last two parts Next week. So, John and Jesus, all grown up, part one. Uh, today, we're going to look at the prophesied voice, verses one to six, and the pointed call, verses seven to 14. And then next week, we'll come to the preeminent figure, verses 15 to 20, and the perfect son, verses 21 to 38. And that really does take us all the way through to the end of the chapter where we get this genealogy. And then we have essentially the beginnings of Jesus' ministry. We see Jesus uh, being tempted. We see Jesus going out the beginning of his ministry. And so we've, we've left John. John comes back into the picture uh, later. But we, we, we leave John and we go to Jesus. And so it very much is that same pattern. John introduced. John and Jesus tied together. John recedes. Jesus is the focus. And that's what we've been doing for two chapters, and now we're going to do it with them as adults in this third chapter. So first, we have the prophesied voice. And for that, look with me at verses 1 to 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Traconitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The beginning of this passage brings us back to the opening of Luke's gospel. So the beginning of chapter 3 takes us back to the very beginning of the gospel as a whole, where Luke tells his readers, and Theophilus in particular, that he is carefully writing an orderly narrative account 
of the things concerning Jesus based on eyewitness testimony. Now, I've included a lot of words there. Let me say that again, that he is carefully writing an orderly narrative account of the things concerning Jesus based on eyewitness testimony. And I I include all of that to essentially summarize everything we find in those first four verses. In other words, Luke introduces the gospel as a historian. And this is emphatic. Uh, This is very clear. The gospels are all historical. But Luke has chosen to introduce his gospel in this way, very conscientiously to say, listen, reader, what you are about to read is truth. And not just truth in a philosophical sense, in an abstract sense. These things are tangibly true, literally true, historically true, verifiably true. They happened. These things happened. Luke is concerned with tracking details and situating events. He wants his readers to understand that this is not some legendary or philosophical literature. This is not some moral tale that helps people navigate life better. Jesus is not some sort of uh, archetypal figure or some sort of metaphor for life or, or humanity in general, though he does fit those descriptions as well. This is history. These things actually happened, and they happened in a particular place at a particular time. And here Luke situates these events in time. During the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of Rome after Augustus, During the governorship of Pontius Pilate, a Roman prefect placed over Judea by the Romans. And during the divided rule of Herod, Philip, and Lysanias, local rulers supported and overseen by the Romans. By the way, isn't this striking to us that these are the names mentioned politically? This just goes to show where Israel is at. And it helps us make sense of what we've been reading in those first two chapters when Mary praises the Lord for humbling and humbling those who are proud and exalting the lowly. When Zechariah praises God that the enemies of Israel will be pushed back and done away with. When we hear Anna talking about the redemption of Jerusalem. All of this This language that is politically oriented makes much sense in this state that that ultimately the Christ is going to reverse what we see here. And that is is a, a kingdom, a people that are entirely under the rule of wicked men. Entirely under the rule, not of those who love Torah, Not of those who are like the Psalm 1 man who meditate on it day and night and delight in the law of the Lord. Not those who truly want to please God, but those who have other gods. Those who have no regard for God. These are godless, oppressive rulers. But Messiah is here. And one day, we will see him rule, I believe, on the earth in fulfillment of what the prophets say. Herod and Philip here are children of Herod the Great. We read uh, of two of Herod's children here whom Luke used as a reference point at the very beginning of the gospel. So as we open up the beginning of the gospel, chapter 1, verse 5, We read, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah. Well, that's the dad of Philip and here, this Herod of Galilee. After the death of Herod, his kingdom had been divided up and placed under the rule of some of his sons. And so we see here two of them. Luke also places these events in the high priesthood of Annas and his son-in-law, Caiaphas. Now, this is also interesting. Just as we pause for a moment, we think about these names. It's also an anticipation of the cross. Because here we have Annas and Caiaphas, 
The two figures whom Jesus appears before when he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's brought before these rulers of the Jews, he's brought uh, to trial, if you could call them a trial, and then ultimately by these religious leaders, he's brought to the Roman governor, Pilate, to be murdered, to be killed, to be crucified. So even here at the beginning of Jesus's, the introduction to Jesus's ministry, here at the beginning of the story from adulthood, we see a little anticipation of what's to come at the cross. Those who will be most instrumental in putting Jesus on the tree. So Luke has captured the moment here with layers of history. Imperial rule, local rule, and religious rule. And this is when it all happened. But what? What do I mean? What happened? Well, we find it at the end of verse 2. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. That's what happened. These are, of course, powerful, history-moving words. No surprise, God spoke all things into existence at the beginning of time. God speaks and things happen. When God speaks, the universe is made. God said, let there be light. And there was a long pause and someone started to argue with God. No. God said, let there be light. And there was light. This is God's might. This is his authority. This is his control. This is his uniqueness and holiness as the creator. When God speaks, things happen. Powerful things are set in motion. And here... We see that the word of the Lord comes to John. God tells John that it's time. He's been in the wilderness. And now it is time. And this is placed here, this language is placed in the language of the Old Testament prophets. Let me just show you this briefly. 1 Samuel 15.10, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. 1 Kings 18.1, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me. That's Jeremiah speaking. Ezekiel 7.1 says the same thing. The word of the Lord came to me. This is very much prophetic language. And any reader of this who is steeped in Judaism, who is steeped in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, is going to recognize this immediately. This is the prophetic call. And as is typical among the prophets, the prophet's father is named. So here, John is called the son of Zechariah. And you get that with Jeremiah. You get that elsewhere where the prophet is named as the son of so-and-so. Here, John is cast in prophetic terms. The prophetic office and ministry has returned after a long silence because the fulfillment has come. And it's really easy for us to underplay this. Just the end of verse two, just to underplay these words. Okay, the word of the Lord came to uh, John and now things are gonna start moving. This is four centuries without this kind of prophetic work and this prophetic office. Now we've seen prophetic utterance. We've, Anna is referred to as a prophetess. We see Simeon prophesying. We see Zechariah prophesying. We have Mary prophesying in her Magnificat. So we've seen all of this earlier with the the birth of John and the birth of Christ. But here we are meant to see a full-blown prophet in the likes of Elijah, Samuel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so on and so forth. The cataclysmic shift in history has now come. And God calls John out of the wilderness to a ministry around the Jordan River. And if you look at a map of Palestine, it's pretty simple. There's this river that runs through the center, uh, north and south. It runs vertically. This is the Jordan River. And we have already been told that John spent his early years out in the wilderness. We read this in chapter 1, verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit. And he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Well, that time has now come. 
And in the other Gospels, we're given uh, these details that John is wearing this, uh, this very coarse camel's hair clothing, and he's eating locusts and wild honey. This is an entirely independent prophet. He doesn't need to go anywhere to find food. He just literally, in the most extreme way, he's living off of the land. He's wearing a coarse garment. Uh, as a picture of repentance and, and, and the, the need to, to be uncomfortable in sin and to mourn over sin. You think of sackcloth and ashes. He's separated from the people. He is entirely communing with God. This is what is going on with John all the way from whenever that began to this time around the age of It really is fascinating to think of John, and some people have speculated that was John with the Qumran community, with the Essenes, and you think about the Dead Sea Scrolls, did he kind of venture out there and hang out with those guys for a little while and then leave? I mean, we just don't know these details. Uh, My impression, though, is that he's simply out there with God. He's out there with the Lord. He's communing with God. He's eating bugs and honey, and he is waiting. He's waiting for his call, and the time has now come. The public appearance to Israel has now come. So John, the prophet whom God has separated and prepared in this way in the wilderness, must now begin his ministry. And that whole ministry of John is summed up in verse 3. So Luke goes ahead, he gets us into the meat of it all. He he just summarizes the whole thing in verse three. So look at verse three with me. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what John's about. That's what John's doing. That's John's mission. That's John's ministry. That's John's role. If you were to drop in on John at any point during this time, that's what he would be doing. Verse 3. John was to be a baptizer. And in fact, it is better to call John John the Baptizer than John the Baptist. And it is striking When you call him John the Baptist, people really think that he was a Baptist and not a Presbyterian or a Methodist or whatever. I mean, when you're talking with people, and I, I, you know, maybe, maybe you came in with that idea. Uh, John the Baptist is John the Baptizer is the way we should think of John. He is one who immersed others in water as a representation of cleansing. This baptism was a sign of a deeper Reality, the reality of repentance. We're going to talk about that a lot this morning. The reality of repentance. A changed mind and a reoriented life. A turning away from the old towards the new. And let me just stop there and say this. If you are a Christian, that happened to you. Let me say that again. If you are a Christian here this morning, a true Christian that has absolutely essentially happened to you. Let me flip that around. If that has not happened to you, you're not a Christian. Now the Lord works in in ways, different ways in our lives and some of us go through seasons where the Lord is working on us and we can't pinpoint a specific time. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that in the life of every Christian, there is this cataclysmic event whereby a mind changes and a life is reoriented, a conversion happens. There is a turning away from the old man. The man described in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 dead in trespasses and sins, following the course of this world, following Satan, children of wrath, enslaved to lusts and pleasures, consumed with self, loving the world. That's what it looks like to simply be born on earth and to grow up on earth. We need to repent away from that. 
All Christians are those who have repented and turned away. And this call to repentance, this baptism for repentance, was an anticipation of the baptism of the Spirit that Messiah would bring which John will refer to later. It's anticipating that baptism of the Spirit that Jesus will bring. And then, of course, Christian baptism, physical baptism, which is a symbol of that reality. Christian baptism is a symbol of spirit baptism that Jesus brings when he regenerates a person's heart. It's a sign of what's already taken place in a person's life as we have been united to Christ. So there is a distinction here between John's baptism and the baptism that we have as Christians. And so we meet these people in Acts who have been baptized in John's baptism, and they need to be baptized into Christ. They need to be baptized, to use the language at the end of Matthew, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. need to be baptized as believers in the fulfillment, not those participating merely in the work of the forerunner. This baptism of repentance towards or into the forgiveness of sins was in preparation for the forgiveness that would come through Messiah. John does not, is not able to forgive. Going through this water is not able to provide forgiveness, but this is all preparation for what Messiah will bring by the Spirit through his work on the cross. And that brings us to Isaiah's quote. John was not only a prophetic figure, he was a prophesied figure, a figure whom the prophets before him had foretold, one who was to come with a very specific role. Now, you get the prophets in the Old Testament. They are prophetic figures, but not prophesied figures. They they are, in a sense, corporately understood, going back to Deuteronomy and going back even to Exodus. They're corporately understood in that way, but their individual work is not prophesied. John is actually prophesied by the prophets, one who was to come with a very specific role. And quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, Luke tells us that John is the prophesied voice, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and it is a cry of preparation. He calls others to prepare for Christ's coming, and he says that the way is being made for the Christ. There is, it's interesting the language that Isaiah uses here, and that is quoted here in the mouth of John the Baptist by Luke. There is this leveling this straightening, and this smoothing. And it's interesting to me that those really are the three things you think of when you think of a path. We've all been on a path that's not level. It's more difficult to move across. We've all been on paths that aren't straight, windy roads, kids throwing up in the back seat, stomachs churning, huge vehicles swerving around corners about to go off the side of the mountain. I've been on those roads in western North Carolina as we think about what's going on there, those windy roads in the mountains. So leveling, straightening, and then smoothing. These bumpy paths, you can think of someone maybe in a wheelchair going across a path that's filled with rocks or pebbles. They can't even go across it because it's so bumpy. Too many rocks, too many pebbles, too many divots in the ground. All of this language is used with respect to John's ministry, with respect to the coming of the Christ, that the people are like a path collectively, and there is this leveling, this straightening, this smoothing that is happening for this coming Christ. In other words, things are being set right. Hearts will be changed. God's plan will come to fruition. But even more specifically, we see here the language of mountains being brought low and crooked ways being straightened. This is the language of conversion. Conversion from pride and wickedness to humility and a straight path. And this is the language of what God is doing in hearts. This is the language of what God is going to do among his people. His people are like a path that's that's not level. It's filled with cracks and bumps and divots. 
It's perverse and twisted. It is not straight. This is the salvation of God through changed hearts that all peoples, all flesh will see. And this brings us more specifically to John's message. And now we come to the second point, the pointed call. We've looked at the prophesied voice, the figure of John, the role of John, what it is that he is doing, his call out of the wilderness, and then how that is rooted in Old Testament prophecy. And now we see a little bit more about what he's saying. What are the words coming out of his mouth as he's walking all around the Jordan, preaching and baptizing? I think one of the first things that comes to mind when we think about John the Baptist, aside from the the locusts and the wild honey, of course, is that he was a fiery preacher. I think if I were to go around and sort of take a a poll and ask everyone, what's, what's the one thing that stands out to you the most about John the Baptist? Give me one phrase, give me one sentence, that's probably the one that would dominate. You know that old show, Survey Says. I think that would be the number one answer, that John was a fiery preacher. His words, his call to the people, exposed reality and it cut straight to the heart. And that in and of itself is an anticipation of Jesus. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is slicing. It is penetrating to the heart. No sinner can stand before the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount squishes, but then it builds up in Christ. And I remember we took a year almost to go through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and just the way that Jesus penetrates with his teaching into the human heart. And we see a little precursor of that, a little forerunning of that here with the work of John. His message was a pointed call to one thing, repentance. That was the message of John. And I think we can divide this section into two parts, fruit needed and fruit illustrated. And by the way, his message was repentance as he points to Christ. Repent, behold the lamb. Repent, behold the lamb. So we get two parts to this, and this is what we're, where we're going to finish this morning. We get fruit needed and fruit illustrated. So first, fruit needed. Look with me at verses 7 to 9 as we take on the first part of this section. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. By the way, let me just say, this has been a part of Christian preaching since the beginning of the church. Any preaching that lacks these themes is not preaching. Any preaching that does not cut to the heart in this way does not deserve to be called preaching. And that, of course, is the reason why so many well-known preachers in the last several decades have decided to replace the title preacher with the title communicator. It's just so much more palatable. It's so much more worldly. And it's so much at odds with Christian preaching, with the history of the Jewish people and the prophets and John and the preaching of Christ himself and all those who came after him. Here, We do not get a friendly introduction to build rapport with his audience. That's not here. You don't imagine John just sort of coming up to the river and and starts, you know, sort of mingling and and shaking hands and, and, and saying, hello, hey guys, how's it going? 
That's not what John is doing. That, that's just not here in any way, shape, or form at all. John is not interested in building rapport or making friends. He's not interested in being popular, well-received, to ultimately lose his head. He's simply interested in doing the work that God has called him to do. He's interested in being faithful. That's John's job. He is a prophet of God calling the people to wake up and get ready. And let me say this. There is a sense in which that's always the message of Christian preaching. Because Christ is coming. He's coming back. And throughout the New Testament, the apostles are clear to communicate in this way. Wake up and get ready. Lest, as John says, we be ashamed before him at his coming. Or as Jesus himself says in the Sermon on the Mount, we end up saying, Lord, Lord. And Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness, for I never knew you. John is calling the people to wake up and get ready, and we are doing the same in this church. In every true church, calling ourselves, calling my own heart, a Trey calling his own heart, and we, all of us, as we communicate to God's people, calling God's people, wake up and get ready. The world smells so nice, and we're immersed in it. We're tasting it. We're drinking it down. But wake up and get ready. Because death is around the corner, and the coming of Christ could come at any moment. He says to the people, this is his sermon introduction, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. This is this is like an arrow to the heart. This is fearless and courageous preaching to those who could immediately put him to death. So what is going on? By the way, let me just say this. Those who are just caving to all of this LGBTQ stuff and trying to be friends with the world, that is what is needed today among Christians is courage. It's just simple courage in the Lord. And I don't mean macho, chest-beating, self-reliant courage. I mean courage in Christ. I mean courage in the Lord, guided by, governed by the Spirit of God. And that is what we see with John's entire ministry, even calling out Herod later. He'll be arrested and beheaded. It's courage, moral courage. And that's what it takes in your workplace. That's what it takes at, at school. That's what it takes today in this anti-Christian culture, very antagonistic to the Christian faith, not just neutral we were talking with some folks in Scotland, and they were saying that they're seeing a change from antagonism to more of a neutrality. And they're seeing an openness to the gospel in Scotland now because there's no longer this sort of antipathy towards it. There's just sort of they don't even know about it. And it's just another thing on, on the list of, that people do. And so it's given opportunity. In our country, it is becoming increasingly antagonistic, adamantly antagonistic. And we see here the need for courage. So what is going on with these words of John? Well, here we see a crowd of people coming to John to receive something. They're not there for no reason. They're there to get something and specifically to receive the sign. They want to be dunked. They're there to be dunked in water that John was providing for them, a kind of cleansing that had been anticipated in the sacrificial system and in the baptism of Gentile converts to Judaism. John is out there doing this religious exercise. And, you know, we're all drawn to excitement. You know, anytime you're on the playground in school and there's this commotion, you go to it. You're like a fly just flocking to it because you, in, we're interested in these sorts of things. You see people do this on the internet. There's some kind of controversy or some kind of thing and everybody just flocks to it. It's just built into our fallenness as human beings, just running to the controversy, running to the big thing going on. And so there's, there's crowds, people starting to gather. And John's words seem to be a challenge about sincerity. Sincerity. 
And Jesus does this all throughout his ministry with the crowds. It's, it's a challenge about sincerity. And we know that in Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, these words are directed specifically to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders. So here they are probably, the Pharisees and Sadducees, as we picture this in Luke's mind, the Pharisees and Sadducees aren't mentioned by Luke, mentioned by Matthew, but they're probably leading this large crowd of Jewish people. And they're coming to see what in the world is going out here, going on out here around the Jordan River. And John speaks to them with a particular eye on these leaders, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees, but it bleeds over into the crowd as a whole. And John is essentially saying, are you here simply to receive some religious right, or do you understand the need for a change of heart? Are you here to receive some kind of religious thing, or are you here for a change of life? And listen, in light of the coming wrath of God against sin. That's what John means. Are you here to become a different person in light of God's coming, impending judgment on sin? And, and I, just, I just want to throw that out there as well to all of us. Why, why are we here? Why are you, why'd you get up this morning and come here? You could be lounging on your front porch. You could be out on your deck listening to the birds. Not a cloud in the sky today. You could be just hanging out with friends, having brunch, whatever. But you're here listening to some guy talk loudly up in front of you for an hour, for a whole hour. What in the world? Why? Why are, why are, why are you here? I pray. I hope. It is because you want a changed heart and a changed life because the wrath of God is coming. And we need Christ to be free from that wrath. John is dealing with weighty, eternal things. Not trivial, religious, ceremonies and symbols. The temptation of John's hearers is presumption. And we know that because of what John goes on to deal with. It's this sin of presumption to presume on their relationship to Abraham, to presume on their ethnic identity. And let me just say this. We can presume in all kinds of ways too. You know, I'm a church member. Um, my parents are Christians. My wife's a Christian. Maybe you're here and you're riding the coattails of your spouse. You're not a Christian. Maybe you're not a Christian. You've just flown under the radar for months and years and even decades because your spouse is, but you're not. Your heart's still the same. There's never been repentance. There's never been trust in the blood of Christ to redeem you from sin. You're just under the radar because your wife or your husband is a Christian. Presuming, maybe I'll get folded in. You won't. You'll be cast out. To think that simply because they have this physical identity, they will be okay in the end is utter foolishness. And John smashes that. He takes a wrecking ball to this notion of presumption. And Paul does the same in Romans 2, verses 3 to 4. Do you suppose, O oh man, after he's blasted the Gentiles, you can see the Jewish reader going, yep, those Gentiles, they're so bad, they're so wicked. And then in chapter 2, he turns his gaze from the Gentiles to the Jews, and he says this, do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Repentance, presuming on one's ethnic identity or one's belonging to a people is not going to work. God, John says, can raise up descendants for Abraham from the very rocks. And one commentator said, just as God had created man from the dust, he can raise up descendants for Abraham from the rocks. What is needed to avoid being cut down and thrown into the fire, which is a picture of hell, is, 
Hell, as you see Lazarus and the rich man, the rich man dies, he opens up his eyes in hell and he wants a drop of water. He wants one drop of water. There are times when I'm thirsty and I drink a big old glass of water and I think about that passage. A man in hell wanting just a small drop of water. But that's not the end. We're told in Revelation that there's this thing called the lake of fire and it's called the second death. See, the rich man in hell had not yet been judged for all of his sins and mistreatment of Lazarus. He was just in there waiting in his misery and in his utter distress. Waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting to be raised, as Daniel 12 says, so that he could stand before God in his body with which he sinned and be judged by God in his body and cast into the lake of fire. That's what's in view. That's what's in view. How weighty a thing it is, what we do with this Christ. So we have presumption here. Keeping them from turning and with the warning that they be cut down. Verse 8, John makes it clear what is needed. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And that really is the core of John's message as we think about him pointing to Christ, and he will point to Christ quite literally, behold the Lamb of God. But this is the core of his preaching message, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. That is at the center. The way is prepared as hearts are prepared. However, we cannot merely talk about hearts. By the way, when I say hearts, I think this is really confusing to kids. Um, because they think three things. They think that organ that beats in their chest, the heart that they draw on their paper, and then this thing that mom and dad talk about that really doesn't match either of those, uh, but it's the core of the person. It's the spiritual core of the person. And we cannot merely talk about hearts because hearts are inextricably tied to behavior. You know, we recognize the great value of the emphasis in counseling and other uh, kinds of teaching over the last couple of decades on the heart. Idols of the heart, shepherding a child's heart, and all of that. And it's very significant, it's very important work, and it is absolutely where the focus must be. Jesus makes that clear in the Sermon on the Mount. But here's the problem. There is a way in which, in our sinfulness, we can take that truth And so accentuate it to the point that behavior is just lost. So we're not interested in mere behavior modification, to use Paul Tripp's language. But we are interested in behavior. Because behavior and the heart are inextricably tied together. And I love the way in Jay Adams' book, Competent to Counsel, he's the father of sort of biblical counseling, the movement. He focuses on this. He makes this point that we should be counseling towards concrete behavior changes that, of course, flow out of a new heart. Once again, if we're not careful, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's what we do. That's what we do. So let's look at John's emphasis, and it is an emphasis on behavior. Fruit illustrated. Look at verses 10 to 14 as we close. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, and we What shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. Well, you might be thinking, man, we've sort of fallen out of the clouds. We have. You might be thinking, you know, it was so weighty and substantive before and so rich and theologically robust. And now we're talking about, you know, tunics and wages and extortion. Yes. Yes. Of course. Here we see that John the Baptist's call to true repentance is intensely practical. It is intensely tangible. It is intensely concrete. And Satan wants us to keep it in the ether. He wants us to keep this notion of repentance vague and general. 
without any teeth, without any bite, without any weight and substance. God wants us to put some some skin on the bones, to put some fingernails on it. God wants us to smell it, taste it, and touch it, to feel it. Repentance is seen in everyday life. This is real life stuff. It's not a church word. Repentance, oh yes. Vague, without meaning. This is real life. The crowds come first. What do we do? Essentially, John says, share and give to those in need. This is an emphasis of the New Testament, and we see it in two places where it has particular sting. James chapter 2, verses 15 to 16, which we're coming up, working through in our Bible study. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Oh, it's just so sweet. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? It's vaporous. It's ethereal. It, it's not real. It's just some kind of mouth service, lip service on the surface. It's religious behavior and activity that has no substance. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Now listen. This kind of language has to fall on each of us in our own spheres of life. And we can't be looking around judging one another by what we have and what we give. We don't even know that. I don't even know what anybody gives in the church. There's only, well, I'm not going to say that. Very few people, very few people even have any idea what people in the church give. And that's intentional. But God works in each of our hearts and our consciences to help us understand what it is that he requires of each of us. And so I just, I just let, it, let it fall. Let James 2 fall. Let 1 John 3 fall. And let God do with that in your heart what he intends to do this morning. Tax collectors, what do we do? Be honest and don't steal. Soldiers, what do we do? Don't extort. And be content with your wages. Don't, don't use your, your strength, your might, your role in the military to mistreat people. It's interesting here that John, this is, this is really interesting. I just want to make this point. I had some pacifist friends in the UK. In fact, I was the, there was two or three guys who were pacifists, and we would just be arguing about these sorts of things, you know, as, as people do. And it's interesting here that uh, John doesn't tell them to stop being soldiers, Right? I don't think it's a sin to be in the military. And we, we think about just war and we think about all those things. And those are, of course, all factored in. But John doesn't say, you must stop. You must stop serving in the military. You've got to get out. It's just altogether sinful. You must be a pacifist if you are to be a true follower of God. He doesn't do that. He calls people to faithful, godly, loving living where they are. In these situations, even the tax collector can do his work righteously rather than under the Romans and then going out making money. Of course, all the tax collectors would have been under the Romans, but some of them would, would inflate what was paid by the people so that they could get rich themselves. And you see this with Zacchaeus, the wee little man. Zacchaeus, God comes to him and Zacchaeus, he turns away from that. We see it with Levi, Matthew, he turns away from that. The tax collectors are not to steal. The soldiers are not to extort. You could really summarize John's message simply with keeping the Ten Commandments. That's what he's after. Love others, Jesus says. uh, Treat others as you would have them treat you. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor. All the law, the prophets hang on this. But how does this happen? Only through Christ. The only way that any person ever keeps the Ten Commandments, the only way that any person ever gets in line with the Ten Commandments. You know, when we're born, we're going against the stream like a salmon. We're going against the stream of the Ten Commandments. And God saves us and he puts us in the stream. We're now now going downstream with the Ten Commandments. In line. Imperfectly so, but in line. 
But here we see the great need we have for Christ. John's ministry, John's baptism cannot stand alone. In calling for changed lives and holding out forgiveness, John is preparing the way for the only one who can do that. The only one who can change lives, the only one who can change hearts, who can change behavior, the only one who can forgive sins is the Christ, the Son of God, or to use the language from our final two points, the preeminent figure and the perfect Son. And that's where we will turn next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have given us here in your word. We pray that you would guide us with it that you would sanctify us, Father, and help us to be greatly appreciative of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Redeemer. We thank you that he kept the Ten Commandments perfectly, that he died in accordance with the sacrificial laws in our place, and that the gospel has now come to us freely offered through him. We thank you for this Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.